thanks everyone for joining us for what is now our uh, second Science and Sandwiches program. We're excited to bring in Dr. Eric Gorsak. We'd like to thank iBio for helping us promote this program. Our goals here are to give you access, differential access to speakers, give you a chance to ask a real paleontologist some questions about his work, his background and what he does. Um, and that's kind of the goal to get you guys to ask questions. So I'll, I'll open up with a few and then we'll turn it over to you. Um, but now I'll introduce Eric, who is our speaker. He's an assistant professor at Midwestern University whose work focuses on reconstructing evolutionary relationships between extinct animals, as well as teaching anatomy courses for medical students. He specializes in titanosaurian sauropods, which I'm sure is a definition that we can get for you during the program. Um, Eric, thank you for joining us. We're happy to have you. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to, to bestow all my knowledge about dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's why we're all here. Um, so we'll start with the first question. This is one we picked out together. Um, so why do you do a lot of your research in Africa and what makes the research that you do in Africa so important? Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. Um, so yeah, my background, I work on, like, as you mentioned, titanosaurian dinosaurs um, and Africa. This seems like the two main focuses of my research. Uh, but if we take a step back and like look at Africa's like history and Earth's history, uh, we go back to the days of Pangaea, where we had that supercontinent, where all the continents were together as one. And this is basically during the start of the, the age of dinosaurs. But as the age of dinosaurs progressed, the continents started to break apart into what we see today uh, in terms of their modern configuration of the continents. However, when it comes to the fossil record, uh, the amount of rocks uh, on each continent pertaining to certain time eras during the age of dinosaurs, there's a lot of gaps in there. So the age that I'm interested in is in the Cretaceous, which is the third act of the age of dinosaurs right before they went extinct. And when we look at those age deposits globally, they're present on all continents, but Africa tends to have a little bit difficulty of finding those age rocks. So in a way, Africa has been this giant question mark or very fuzzy in terms of the fossils found during this time era. And this is important because uh, some of the like animals that we find in the surrounding continents like South America, North America, even Antarctica and Australia, Madagascar and Europe, we have a good solid idea of what animals are living there. But during this time on Africa, it's a little bit fuzzy. So it's this giant question mark right in the smack dab middle of basically Pangaea and post Pangaea. So really it's in trying to fill in these gaps and trying to connect the dots from the faunas of the surrounding land masses. So a lot of my work is basically looking at those animals that we can find on Africa and figure out what are they first off and who are they related to South American forms, European forms, or even Asian forms, or perhaps even Australian or Antarctic uh, dinosaurs, which is still another gap, a major gap in our, our knowledge for dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, would you say there's a lot of work left to be done in order to fill in the gaps in our understanding of dinosaurs? Oh yeah. There's, there's, there's plenty of gaps. Uh, uh, in the data that we have. We don't have a perfect fossil record from the beginning to the end of the age of dinosaurs or even just all of Earth's history. Um, there's just gonna be time periods that are just gonna be unknown, uh, large chunks of time missing for certain land masses that just didn't have the rocks deposited. And without those deposits, you don't get fossilization of the dead animals. So there's gonna be persistent gaps, but we also know that there are still areas to for more discovery and exploration to fill in those gaps. And that's kind of part of my research is looking at those areas and just starting to fill in the gaps of what we have. Yeah, I'm sure filling in those gaps is, is a pretty exciting aspect of the work that you do. Yeah, um, and in a way that's science is just filling in the gaps of the unknown. Yeah, I think that's a, a great distillation of science. Um, and, and speaking of filling in those gaps, I know that you have uh, identified some important fossils in your work. Um, do you want to talk about some of those fossils that you've discovered? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> some of these are dinosaurs that I wouldn't say I discovered, like I wasn't out in the field. Uh, some of these were actually uh, dug up before I started grad school, but they were just left waiting to be worked on. And as a grad student, I was just fit right on in and worked on these projects. And I just kind of blossomed from there, going to different museum collections and working on things that have yet to be formally studied and described. And some of these dinosaurs that I've worked on and ended up naming are, are some of these titanosaurian dinosaurs. Um, it's mostly from Tanzania. I've named three dinosaurs from there, uh, all titanosaurs. Um, titanosaurs, just so everyone's on the same page, 
Uh, they're a group of sauropod dinosaurs, these long neck, long tailed herbivorous dinosaurs, kind of like Brontosaurus or Littlefoot from uh, the land before time. Here's a good representation. This is one of the most recent dinosaurs I've named uh, from 2019. This is a uh, Mnyamawam Tuka, um, Oyawam Kia, which is just the name I gave. Uh, it's Swahili for the animal from the Mtuka, which is the name of the river drainage that we found these bones. And Mnyamawam Kia refers to this heart-shaped part of the tailbone. It kind of gave it a really loving name. And uh, funny that uh, it has this little heart-shaped tail uh, part, and it came out the day before Valentine's Day in 2019. So, like, the timing was just perfect for this animal to be to be known to the world. So that was the, the like the latest one. Two other ones from Tanzania include Ruquititon bisapultus, which is the first dinosaur I worked on and kind of holds a special place in my heart. Um, I remember like the first year of grad school and my advisor's like, here, work on this thing. And like, okay. So uh, it has a special place in my heart. And then there's another one called Shingopanus unguensis, uh, which is another titanosaur. So those are from Tanzania. I've also worked on a new titanosaur from Egypt uh, a couple of years ago, back in 2018. Um, is called uh, Monsaurosaurus Shahine. So here's a nice picture of, or at least the artist renditioning of Monsaurosaurus. Once again, these long neck, long tailed dinosaurs. Uh, but they're not, they were, they were also the largest dinosaurs to ever live, but also some of the smallest in terms of this, this group of sauropod dinosaurs. So don't let the name Titanosaur fool you. There are also some of the smallest sauropods as well. And Monsaurosaurus is on the smaller end on that range of body sizes for this group of animals. And this is with a really nice project working with our colleagues in Egypt, a bunch of students, uh, several female students, a couple of uh, male students, as well as other colleagues from Egypt. Uh, it's a nice little international collaboration with folks from Ohio University where I uh, did my PhD, as well as from Pittsburgh with the Carnegie Museum and the Denver Museum out in Colorado. Here's a nice field picture of our Egyptian colleagues uh, digging up all the remains of this animal. Uh, so those jackets is what we're calling those little white things are made of plaster and burlap. And that's how we encase fossils in the field to protect them and then transport them back to the lab to continue work and studying them uh, once we excavate them from the quarry. So yeah, Monsaurosaurus was a nice one. Um, uh, and then currently I have a couple more dinosaurs I'm working on, on one from Kenya. And currently I'm really in the thick of working on another Egyptian dinosaur uh, where the bones are currently housed in Berlin, but they were first uh, excavated in uh, Egypt back in the late seventies. So I'll get to our first audience question that came in the chat a little bit ago. Um, Lydia is wondering how you became a paleontologist and perhaps any advice you have for someone who wants to be a paleontologist. Oh, that's a great question. It's still, it's still weird. Like I've been doing paleontology for like 10, 11 years now. And I still feel, it feels weird to be referring to myself as a paleontologist, even though I've like named dinosaurs gone so many digs and whatnot. But how it started is just, uh, I was in college and there was a couple of professors that I knew that did some paleontology for their research. So I contacted them and just like, Hey, I just want to meet up and see what is it like for paleontology? What's research like? Just really just contact somebody from your university that does paleontology or related to paleontology. Uh, even if there's like a museum, you can, there's usually outreach programs. You can talk to paleontology and just get an idea of what it's like. Um, but from there, just uh, continued on into grad school where I focused and worked with those people eventually. Uh, these my, eventually my advisor, Pat O'Connor and uh, his colleague, Nancy Stevens. Um, so really, it's just a continuation in making these connections, just reaching out to paleontologists from universities and even museums, um, in which case it just snowballed into my graduate degree, uh, working my PhD with them. And it just kind of snowballed from there, right? Just uh, after I, I got my PhD, I was able to get a uh, postdoctoral research position at the Field Museum here in Chicago. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a childhood dream of just being a paleontologist working at a museum. Um, so yeah, it's just one of the things, just reach out and talk to paleontologists, other researchers, and see if there's any like opportunities to, you know, see what their lab is like, what their research is like, if there's any fieldwork opportunities. I know most, uh, most paleontologists out West, they welcome volunteers in the field. They, there's always help to be needed. In fact, that's how I got my start. I talked to my 
these professors and they hooked me up with some people they knew out in Utah that did field work and they welcomed volunteers. So one summer I was like, let's do this. So I went to Utah and volunteered and fell in love with field work and paleontology all over again. So it's just really reaching out to people and trying to make those connections and see if that's something you want to pursue. And it'll usually give you some avenues to follow. I think that's really good advice for, for anyone who wants to get involved in science research, right? Is just reach out and try it and see if you like it. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned that you worked for Field Museum. Do you have any of your, any fossils that you've found on some of the archeological or sorry, paleontological uh -oh. <laughs> digs? I caught myself. Um, paleontological digs displayed at the Field Museum. Yeah, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when I was at the Field Museum, part of my job uh, was to work on an exhibit at the time called Antarctic Dinosaurs. And it opened up in the summer of 2018 and it's currently on tour uh, at the, I think it's currently at the Utah Museum right now. So if you want to go see that. But uh, uh, for this Antarctic Dinosaurs exhibit, there is fossils from my, uh, my, my boss at the time, Pete McAvicki, uh, fossils he collected in Antarctica. And I've been to Antarctica as well and the team that I worked with, some of our fossils were on display in this exhibit. So in a way, some of the fossils I collected, or at least the team I was part of for the collection, was in this exhibit for a bit, and now it's traveling the country. That's pretty neat. So people, a lot of people have probably gotten to see a lot of the work that you've done, uh, whether they realize it or not, right? Yeah. And plus in the exhibit, there's like picked photos of me just like working on a computer. There's one of me in the field. So it's kind of weird, like I'm actually in the exhibit. Like here's Eric Gorsak. I'm like... <laughs> It's me. I'm in an yeah. exhibit about dinosaurs. That's I'm sure weird. that that probably feels a little <laughs> bit surreal the first time it happens. Yeah, yeah. That's why it still feels so strange <laughs> to me now. I just can't get over it. Yeah. Um, so we got another question in the chat that I'll read out. Uh, Mark okay. Paul wants to know: Are larger dinosaurs more likely to be preserved, and does that give us a distorted sense of the dinosaur population? That is a that is a great question, and that's one thing to keep in mind uh, with a lot of studies. Uh, like going forward, if we want to look at, you know, kind of makeup of the fauna, the, the ecosystems back then, that there is a there is a bias towards preservation of certain fossils versus others. Um, big dinosaurs tend to uh, preserve better because they usually have more robust bones that uh, kind of put up the weathering and erosion. There's just more of it, whereas smaller things tend to just completely erode away. However, there are some certain circumstances where smaller dinosaurs are more better preserved than others. Um, but it really just depends on the environment that they died in, the sedimentation, like how much the sediments and burial occurs, um, and just the amount of erosion that happens between their death and when we discover those bones. Um, here's an example. Uh, that's, oh, that photo that you put up, Alex, that was a um, that's a partial neck bone of one of the titanosaurs I worked on in Tanzania. Uh, but you can see that's something about, there's my hat for scale. So about, about two or three heads of me uh, for its size. And that's typically what we find is chunks like this that is preserved. Usually you can see tiny fragments of broken bone. But other than that, it really depends on where you're working and the environment in which they, were, they died and preserved in. So it varies. It's one of those things where it's like, yes, but really it depends on the circumstances kind of answer. Yeah, I remember growing up learning that there's so many different factors that go into what makes a good fossil and yeah. all the conditions that underlie creating fossils that give us a picture of our record. Um, about how big would a dinosaur that this vertebra belongs to end up being? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say probably about 20, 30 meters long. Um, it's about like maybe a smaller to medium sized titanosaur. So to really put that in perspective, maybe like the size of a bus, um, give or take a few meters. And that's one of the, the back neck bones. Okay. So yeah, and they usually have like 13 of those, upwards to like 17, so. Yeah, how many do we have? We have seven. Okay, so just a few more on that their end. Yeah, most living um, mammals have seven neck vertebrae. Okay. The weird constraint we have. Um, and that's actually, I think, a good segue into another question that we talked about. So yeah. you're both a, both a paleontologist, um, but you're also teaching anatomy to medical students at right. the same time. Uh, how mm -hmm. do those two topics relate to each other? Yeah, so uh, on a fundamental level, it's all about anatomy. Uh, we go and find dinosaurs, or even just other extinct animals. Um, it's all based on bones. 
and bones are living tissue when they were once alive, influenced by other soft tissues. So you really have to get a good handle of the anatomy of various animals in order to compare and contrast what you find with closely related animals to kind of figure out what they're related to and what they're doing with their arms or bones or whatever anatomical appendage they have. But really for human anatomy, it's just really specific to just one species and that's just homo sapiens, right? So it's still in the same kind of comparative context and looking at evolutionary change of anatomy through time. But this is one that really pays the bills for most paleontologists is teaching human anatomy to med students. But once again, it's still fundamentally, it's anatomy. It's understanding why our bones are shaped a certain way, why our arms do certain things compared to other things. It's all fundamentally just looking at this biological system as one species and understanding its anatomy. And in some ways is how it develops to this anatomy. The evolutionary history of humans can segue into that. You get a better understanding of why the human body is the way it is if you put an evolutionary perspective on it. We're going to switch gears a little bit just to get back to a question that popped up in the chat. Was it difficult to do a dig in Antarctica? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, to an extent. Um, the biggest factor is snow and ice coverage. Um, Antarctica is a landmass uh, underneath all that ice and snow. The trouble is trying to find a, the amount, like trying to find that dirt, trying to find that rock. And usually it's going to be either on the top of mountains. Uh, there's this mountain range in Antarctica called the Transantarctic Mountains. So the tips of those mountains are actually above the ice. So that's where you can get to the rock to find the fossils. But where we were, we were on the peninsula of Antarctica, the most Northern part of the continent, which is weird to think about when it's on the bottom of the earth, right? Um, but usually like the ice, uh, the sea ice covers the uh, shorelines, but during the summertime in Antarctica, most of that goes away. So you have some exposed rock along the coastlines. So there's a very finite amount of time within the, the year that there's the possibility of finding that rock outcrop to kind of prospect and look for fossils. But once all that snow's gone, it's wonderful. It's nothing but rock and you can just look for fossils. I remember we were doing a dig in Antarctica. I think I gave you a photo of this, Alex, but there's, uh, there is, there's the problem of permafrost. So once you get a certain depth into the dirt, then all the water that's uh, in the rock is basically ice and becomes hard. So we found a set of bones uh, that we had to come back each day and remove like maybe an inch of, of rock and wait for that permafrost to melt so it, we can break through it and just slowly get down to the layer until we can get the entire bone and then take it away. So it has its own unique challenges. Weather can change on a dime. Like it would be sunny one, one morning and by the afternoon it's just covered in snow. Wow. So yeah. Um, and is that process of having to come back day after day and slowly excavating just a little bit more of a fossil pretty common? Yeah, uh, I would say so. It depends, once again, on the kind of rock. Usually sandstones are very rough, so you need a lot more, you know, energy and tools to cut through that rock versus just anything that's in kind of a more looser kind of rock is pretty easy to excavate. So once again, it depends on what the rock is, where you are. Um, so it can vary depending on the difficulty. Okay. Um, and what's it like getting all the way down to Antarctica? <laughs> uh, it's a process. Um, for us, uh, going to the peninsula is different than going uh, to like those mountaintops. Um, for for the, getting to the peninsula, we have to go to Chile, uh, to the city called Punta Arenas, where there is a nice port and we take a boat all the way down to the peninsula. And that little passageway of water between the peninsula and the southern tip of South America is known as the Drake Passage. And it's some of the roughest waters. And I remember just getting seasick basically for four days straight. And it's the worst. But once you get there, you're just on the boat and you can just take a little Zodiacs or helicopters to the different islands. Oh yes, here's one of the, uh, this is one of the sites in Antarctica. This is Sandwich Bluff. This is where a bunch of fossils have been found. As you can see, there's plenty of rock exposed there you can kind of see the different layers of rock as well so this is actually one of the most fossiliferous areas of antarctica and we find bones of uh, extinct birds or kind of where dinosaur birds transition into a lot of marine reptiles like plesiosaurs and mosasaurs uh, as well as a lot of other marine life that has hard components to their body parts yeah that's great it i 
I have to admit, Antarctica doesn't look like exactly what I imagined it to. I had my preconceptions <laughs> about it. Um, it's all good. But yeah, it's interesting to see. And I'm sure it sounds like a planes, trains, and automobiles kind of situation to, to get to planes, the bottom and of the snowmobiles. world. And snowmobiles, yeah. <laughs> Helicopters, yeah. Um, yeah. everything. Um, a lot of walking, too. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure on, on probably a lot of the expeditions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So someone is wondering, and we'll see if this is within your within your scope of knowledge or not. Um, is there any truth to permafrost uncovering and perhaps awakening ancient diseases or bacteria? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I can't I can't confidently say that one way or the other. But there is instances of you know frozen woolly mammoths in Siberia and woolly rhinoceros that still preserve soft tissue. Um, still preserves DNA. So there is the chance that some microbes uh, were still preserved frozen. Um, it's just very extraordinary circumstances. Um, but for viruses, I'm not really sure. Um, so there is a, there's probably a very slight chance, but I, I can't really confidently answer that, uh, that question. It's not yeah. really my, in my wheelhouse with frozen things like that. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um... Yeah, I'm sure that's a top of mind question with us all dealing with the pandemic in the last year. Yeah. Um, Ron wants to know if you can elaborate a little bit more on the geological movement of Antarctica throughout the years over the last few yeah. millennia, <clears throat> eons. <laughs> it's been there for the past couple millennia, uh, okay. just sitting at the bottom. Um, but during the time of Pangaea, let's say about 250 million years ago, uh, Antarctica is slightly uh, further north and it was actually conjoined with Pan. Uh, the whole, all the Southern continents. Uh, it was connected to South America. In fact, the Andes and the peninsula of Antarctica is basically the same ridge, basically the same mountain range throughout time. It just broke into past like 30 million years. But for the most part, Antarctica was just jammed up in there with Australia attached to it, New Zealand attached to it. Even India and Madagascar uh, were conjoined with Antarctica and the Eastern side of, of Africa. But as the continents kind of broke and rifted away, uh, Antarctica, Australia, and New Zealand broke away from Africa, and then it was still connected to South. This is my, I love doing this. So here's Antarctica. Not, here's like the southern tip of Africa and South America here, uh, just breaking apart from Africa like that, still connected to South America. And then eventually Australia breaks away, which would be my fingers, but I can't break my fingers off. And then eventually about, uh, this is probably the case within 100, 100, 150 to 100 million years ago. And it's not until about 30 million years ago that finally Antarctica detaches from South America through plate tectonics. And it's not until that point, then you finally get Antarctica that gets frozen over. For most of Antarctica's history, it's kind of like, let's say like Alaska in terms of its environment. Um, kind of like a temperate, uh, what's it called? Or just like a high latitude of forest. You had trees, you had all these animals living there. It's just this high altitude environment until eventually it just broke away from South America, in which case the uh, the ocean currents just started going around Antarctica at that point. Otherwise, that landmass would just divert it or carry warm waters down. So once you get that current going around Antarctica, it just becomes self-isolating, became a runaway like thermos effect of getting colder and colder upon itself, and which case you get ice and snow and then everything eventually dies, except for penguins, because they were already there and they're like, well, we could go extinct or adapt to this they chose to adapt that's pretty amazing uh, i think it's right oh, jeff yeah. goldblum from uh, jurassic park life, finds, life a way. finds a way yeah yeah um and it truly does i think a lot of your work shows that life finds a way as you're yeah. piecing together all the different pieces of evolution throughout the years um lydia is wondering and I we'll see if you know exactly how many fossils you have found so far. Uh, that's a great question and it's one of those things where i i kind of ponder like if I die and there's some sort of maker and I just want to know like the stats of my life, I want to know like how many fossils did I dig up, but most importantly, how many fossils did I walk past and not notice that were kind of important. Yeah. But honestly, I have no idea. It's, it's probably easily in the hundreds, um, mostly tiny fossils um, from places in Tanzania to several bigger ones. Um, so easily hundreds. I can't really put a, a true number on it, but I, I, I found a, quite a few fossils. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's hard to keep track of each little fragment too, since some of them yeah. can be very small. Oh, yeah. um, and I know you just 
published or co co authored um, a new paper. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I can post it in the chat if there's anyone interested yeah, in sure. reading about it. A couple of weeks ago, uh, one of our, once again going to back to our Egypt uh, colleagues and that whole broader project. Uh, one of the students that I've been working on or working with uh, for the past like year or so uh, was able to. Uh, I helped him uh, guide him with identification of some of the fossils they collected in Egypt, uh, help identifying uh, what the bones were, who they were related to, how to think about how do you look at fossils and determine who it belonged to or what group they belonged to, what features to look out for. And he was able to finally get this paper together and we had this paper published a couple of weeks ago in Cretaceous Research. Uh, it's mostly just an occurrence data, uh, some new fossil finds, some new uh, animals that we weren't sure were there, but now we have evidence of that. Um, so this is once again an ongoing project with our colleagues in Egypt, especially working with the students there, uh, really getting and building this large uh, paleo program uh, with Mansoor University going. So yeah, it's published. this paper was just published a couple of weeks ago, and we have a couple more projects down the line that I'm hoping to uh, get out sooner or later. I'm sure it's pretty cool to be part of uh, an international research program. I know yeah. you mentioned that Egypt has a lot of fossils that perhaps are yet to be uncovered. So it's pretty neat mm -hmm. that people who live in that area are going to be able to do the research and they have the tools and expertise now. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and where does most of the, so you find the fossils out in the field, but where does actually most of that discovery of a new species take place? Uh, usually on my laptop. <laughs> Yeah, most of the time uh, throughout the year, we're basically in our labs or in our offices, just on our computer, writing up what we find, uh, or even just going to collections, different museums, and studying other fossils to compare and contrast these different fossils, right? Trying to understand who they're related to and what are some cool features about this new dinosaur that we can say about its biology, its lifestyle. Um, but most of that's going to be, it's, it's, it's just on the computer. You have to study it. You need time to actually look at the fossil and understand what it is that's so special about this fossil or this collection of fossils for this new species. So it takes time, uh, it takes a lot of research um, and a lot of comparisons and understanding other dinosaurs to know what this one fossil really is. And that, like I said, it takes time. But sometimes if you're going to one of these places, let's say Antarctica or an underexplored area in Africa, where we know next to really nothing, most things that you find are very likely to be a new species. You don't know exactly what, but you just know that it's going to be something new and important. So yeah, it takes that some almost, time. That, uh, you know, knowing it's going to be a new species almost reminds me of picking up like a pack of cards and you never know what you're going to find, like a pack of baseball cards or Pokemon cards yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, We're all gamblers in this game. <laughs> a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, so we'll... We're kind of wrapping up, but we have one last question that we'll try to get through and then uh, then we okay. can say our goodbyes. Um, so what's the most high-tech piece of technology or high-tech tool that you use in your work? Uh, that's a great question. It's kind of a toss-up between just having a nice computer that can crunch numbers for me to figure out these relationships. Uh, it's a lot of data to put in there and, and try to like group things based on similarities and differences. But the other tool that I really like is having a 3D printer, which has been really uh, helpful for the past year, given the pandemic, not being able to travel to collections or museums actually see the fossils firsthand. But thankfully, colleagues from those uh, different museums can scan the fossils through uh, through CT scanners that you find in uh, like a, a medical setting, like in hospitals, and being able to print out fossils. So I have here a printout of one of the, the Egyptian dinosaurs that I'm working on. This is one of the toe bones. So it's really nice having a nice 3D you know, exact model of that fossil in front of me, rather than looking at photos where you lose that depth, that like the whole essence of that bone. So this has been really helpful to pass a couple months, just going back and describing and understanding the anatomy of this new dinosaur. And of course, having a bunch of them, you can just kind of start putting them together and seeing that. So it's really nice 3D printing out fossils, especially since a large, my large component of my research is international. It's just having these 3D models is easier to transport uh, it's just an email click and you have basically the 3D files for you. So yeah, I think those are two of the high tech things that I have for my research. Otherwise, paleontology hasn't progressed that much. It's basically shovels and picks to dig out things and plaster and burlap. Yeah. Well, sometimes the tried and true methods are the best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we have a few questions that we won't unfortunately get to, which we apologize for. Um, but since we are at that time or a little over time, um, we do have to wrap up. 
we want to thank you, Eric, for joining us. It was really cool to learn about the dinosaurs that you found, learn about your work now, learn about paleontological digs. Um, I got the word right that time. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We're really appreciative. And Eric, thank you for your time and your expertise. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's always fun to talk about dinosaurs and whatnot. I feel the exact same way.